right. How you doing, Grace Family Church? You guys doing good? I'm excited. You know, I, I'm just excited what's going on at Grace. How many of you heard about our South Tampa campus, right? Around the first weekend of October, we're hoping to, to get that campus started. But this is uh, our new pastor we hired several months ago. You know, we have over 20 pastors now at Grace Family Church because there's a lot of work to be done. And I need to play a lot of golf, so I let them do all the work. <laughs> No, but we have just hired, actually in January, uh, Pastor Mike and his wife, Leanne, are going to be at that campus. Give them a big hand, will you? I notice, I know you're noticing the one difference between Pastor Mike and myself. He's a lot taller than me, okay? But that's okay. <laughs> I'm not bitter at God because he gave me the height I had. But uh, in fact, the last two pastors we hired, Matt is six foot three, he's six foot four, and I'm five eight and three quarter. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but let me just say this. Uh, we've known Pastor uh, Mike uh, for a long time. I'm telling you, he's a great leader. His family is solid in the relation with God. He's got great kids. No one's perfect, but I, there's just something that's solid about this family, and we're excited that they're going to be pastoring down in South Tampa with us, and you're going to hear a great message tonight. Will you welcome Pastor Mike and his wife, Leanne? Thank you. All of our campuses, will you welcome them? God bless you, Mike. We're ready for you. I thank you. Well, and you know what? I, I am so excited to be here and to be sharing, and we're excited to be a part of Grace Family Church. Can we actually, all of our campuses, can we give it up for our lead pastor, Pastor Craig and Debbie Altman? I'm telling you, the more I get to know Pastor Craig and Debbie as a couple, they are incredible, they're encouraging, and they have been great. They've been speaking life into us as a couple, and we're excited because they have such a heart for reaching the Tampa Bay area. And here's what I know. I know that there are friends and family members and you know people around you that you think, oh, they, they, they need to know who Jesus is. Well, I'm telling you, I, I have not met anyone more committed to that than our pastor, Pastor Craig and Debbie. They love creating a place where you can invite those people in where God is going to transform their lives. So we're excited about what's happening in the Tampa Bay area. And let me just say this to all of our campuses out there, too. I want to welcome all of our campuses. And, you know, we have our Ebor campus. Pastor Ralph is the man at our Ebor campus. Uh, Temple Terrace campus, Dean is such a great, Pastor Dean is such a great mentor. And then Waters Avenue campus with Pastor Greg, those guys have been mentors for me. So can we give it up to all of our campuses? <laughs> Love them, and they've been great. And I really feel like South Tampa is, is going to be ready because I've had the privilege to go around to each of the campuses over the last few months and see what they're doing. And they have mentored me and guided me through the process. And we're excited because South Tampa is ready for a church like Grace Family Church. And the reason why I say that is because so many of us every single week have, have come in, our lives have been changed, and our families have been challenged. And we have really seen God do some amazing things in our families. And I believe those stories are going to happen in South Tampa as well. I think there are hundreds and thousands of people whose lives are going to be transformed by, by what God is doing at Grace Family Church. So we're excited. We're hoping to launch in October drywall. We have, drywall is up, which is incredible, and we are moving that direction. So get ready. It's coming. We're excited to be the South Tampa campus at Grace Family Church. Uh, as you met my wife, Leanne, we've been married for a little over 10 years. We have two boys, a six-year-old and eight-year-old, and they are energetic and fun and all boy. They love to wrestle and love to get dirty and everything that boys do, uh, they love it. We actually met at, in Fort Myers, Florida, and I had moved to Fort Myers, Florida to help start a church uh, 14 years ago, and it's a church down there called Next Level Church, and we started it, and we started with 35 people in a movie theater, and over the last 14 years, we have seen God just move and do some incredible things to the church grew into about, about 3,000 people in two different campuses, and during that time, I became really good friends with one of the pastors here, Pastor Chris Bonham. And so when the South Tampa campus started to come online, he and I started talking, and it's like God ordained some things and lined some things up to we got to a place where it just seemed right for me to come up here and be a part of the South Tampa campus. So I'm excited to be a part of the team, excited to be able to share with you this weekend because we are in our fifth week of our summer game series. Now, this is a fun series for me because in the Ash House, we love watching sports. Now, we also love playing sports, but the problem with playing sports is I am six foot four. Which basically means, people, people ask me all the time because I'm six foot four, hey, did you play basketball in school? But here's what they think they think because you're tall, you're also coordinated. 
okay? Here's what I would say. Just because you're tall actually probably means you're not very coordinated. That's kind of what I, I didn't get coordination. I got height, okay? I run. I don't play basketball. And if we play basketball, I will foul you. I want you to know that. So just in case we ever play basketball because I'm not good at it. But my boys, they love playing sports. And even though I didn't play a lot of sports growing up, I, I love to be engaged with coaching them and watching sports with them. And so the first time my oldest son, who's eight now, when he was five, he decided he wanted to play sports. And the easiest sport to get your kid into is soccer, because you throw a ball on the ground, they kick it around, and it, I mean, it doesn't take anything. You just let them all go. Any other sport is too difficult at five years old. So they go, and he starts playing soccer. And, and if you have a young kid, you know that when your kids play soccer, they basically all group up together when they're that young, and they just go around wherever the ball is. There's no strategy, nothing else. It's hard to keep the goalie in the goal. And so it's it just that. That's just the way they play. And so, But when I learned he was going to play soccer, I got on YouTube. And I look, how to teach kids how to play soccer. So we go to the backyard. I throw out some cones. I'm like, all right, you got to do this with the ball, and you got to plan and put your foot on it and all this stuff. I'm just making up. I never played soccer, but I'm trying to help him. And so I'm trying to teach him all of this. So we go out for his first soccer game. And, of course, this is, this is the beginning of his professional soccer career. So I, I'm excited for this day. We're going to take pictures. We're going to remember this moment forever. He'll probably score eight, nine goals. I mean, who knows, but we'll see what happens. And we go out there, and I, I remember looking into this pack of kids who are going around, and they're going around, and they're going around, and as I see them going around in this pack, I'm going, where's my son? And I can't see him in the pack. And my wife goes, he's over there. And I look over there, and as I look over there, I see that he and a kid from the other team are standing there talking trash to each other. Like the ball's over there, and they're standing there, we're going to beat you. No, we're going to beat you. I mean, they weren't doing anything about it. They were just talking trash to each other. And I'm like, hey, Car Karsten, Car Karsten, the ball's over there. And, you know, he'd go run over to the ball, and then the other kid would run over to the ball. Then they'd stop, talk trash to each other, and like the whole game. Happened about three-quarters of the way through the game, and at three-quarters of the way through the game, <laughs> I looked, and they are rolling on the ground in a fist fight. At five years old, because they are talking trash and gonna, and that's the way that they did. That's the way that they did. And then the whole season, the whole season, the parents were calling him the little bruiser. And here's the interesting thing: they all knew I was a pastor. So every time he'd push push over a kid, or every time he'd do something he wasn't supposed to do, they would all look at me, like hey, Pastor Mike. <laughs> like it was like, oh. And you know what I realized as I was teaching my son how to play soccer? I realized. In that moment, that this year was not going to be a year about teaching them how to play soccer. In fact, for most of sports, if you have kids who are young, you know that sports really isn't about teaching them how to play a sport. It's teaching them how to play a sport with others. Because we understand this, and this is kind of an, uh, uh, something we all have a general understanding of. Success and failure in life is determined by how well we play with others. Success and failure in life is determined by how well we play with others. In fact, I would say that if you were to think of the different areas of your life and determine if you are successful or if you want to be successful, most of us measure success by the interactions and the relationships in our lives. That's how we determine success. It's how we think about success. I mean, think about it. In business, most of us think of success and determine success by how we interact with clients, how we do with customers, how we do with coworkers or our boss. In our families, we think about our, how we treat our spouse, how we treat our kids, uh, how we interact with those people in our family. You can have a great car, you can have an incredible house, but if we do not interact with our spouses and our families well, then we will see ourselves as a failure. And this is also true in our spiritual life. I'm going to think about this. In, in, in Matthew chapter 22, a Pharisee actually walks up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, in fact, it's in here in verse 36, a teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Like, what's the most important? If we were just to do one thing, what's the one thing we would do? You know, they're trying to trip Jesus up a little bit. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. In other words, you've got to love God. And, of course, they're all like, okay, we, yeah, that's what we would have guessed. But then he says this, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if we want to be successful in our spiritual life, with our relationship with Jesus, if we want to be successful in our families, our businesses, we have to treat others well and learn to play well with others. Now, I say that, and you guys are probably all like, 
yeah, 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 we get that. Like, we know you've got to be nice to people. That's kind of what you're saying, Mike. You've got to be nice to people. We all kind of understand we have to be nice to people, right? We all have this general understanding. Except that when we leave here, especially at the Van Dyke campus, and we get out in the parking lot, all of the niceness goes away. Because we're all trying to get out, and I ain't letting you in, and as long as I don't make eye contact, I don't have to let you in, right? I'm telling you, it was crazy. I mean, we, we cheer at 1,500 kids, but when there are parents of 1,500 kids in the morning, I'm telling you, Jesus left the building for a minute. I mean, he, he was not in the parking lot. He's all over here. I and mean, we just have that, right? It just comes out of us at different times. I and mean, we just struggle with some of those things. Has anybody gone on vacation this summer with your kids? I don't know about you, but every time I go on summer vacation with my kids, I come back and I'm like, I'm not as good as a dad as I thought I was. I'm not as good of a parent, as a, as a spouse as I think I am. And we just have those times. That even though we know that success in life is determined by how we interact with others, how we play with others, for a lot of us, that's an area where we all still need to work. That's an area where we still need to figure some things out. And I would say this, if you're not a Christian, and, and, and you happen to be in church, and someone dragged you to church, someone told you to watch this message, you're not a Christian. Part of the reason why you've struggled with Christianity is because you know, essentially, Christians are supposed to treat, the, your, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you probably know someone, we all know someone who is a Christian but doesn't do that. That's been a struggle we've had. And to be honest with you, that's just a struggle. We can say we know that we need to treat others well, but sometimes it's just hard to do that. So what I want to do today is I'm going to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 61, and I'm going to look at three different things. We're going to look at three different things, and I believe these three things, when we apply them into our lives as a filter in, in how we interact with others, I believe these three things will actually be a tool for us that we can go into every interaction, we can go into every relationship, and I believe this. I believe it will help us to reflect the character of Jesus. So we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 61. We're actually only going to look at one verse. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. And this is Isaiah, who is a prophet during the day, and he is speaking of Jesus. So he's given a prophecy about Jesus. He says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, which, honestly, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you, and it's upon all of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. But he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring and then he lays out three different things that Jesus brought into every interaction that we as Christians, as Christ followers, need to bring into every interaction as well. He came to bring. He came to bring, and he says this, good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. The first thing that Jesus came to bring that we need to bring into every interaction is hope. Is hope. In every interaction, every relationship we're in, we need to be bringers of hope. People ask me a lot, they say, hey, did you grow up in church? Like, how did you get into this? What's your story? And honestly, I, I didn't grow up in church. Uh, when I was young, my parents got divorced when I was four years old, and my mom remarried, and the guy she remarried ended up being an alcoholic. And it was like the worst version of that. He was abusive physically, he was abusive verbally, and it was one of those things that we did everything we could not to be home because every time we were home, he was just such a destructive person. Even though my mom tried to, you know, protect us from him, he was just a very destructive person. And so we kind of gravitated towards areas of acceptance, me and my siblings. We gravitated towards acceptance. And I started hanging out with the wrong kids. And we started doing things we weren't supposed to do, and we just got in a lot of trouble. And for me as a teenager, I got in a lot of trouble. At the time, I actually lived in St. Petersburg. And I got arrested one time because I broke into two different houses. I got arrested another time because I stole a boat. And every time I tell people, I stole a boat, people are like, how did you steal a boat? My answer is not well because I got arrested for it. So if it was good, I wouldn't have gotten caught for it. The third time I got arrested, I got arrested because I was driving a car that wasn't mine. I had a knife on me. I had some drugs on us. And I was, at the time, I was run away from home. And this cop pulled us over in this car that I was driving. He pulled us over, <laughs> and, and he said, he, you know, he realized that we had drugs with us, a knife with us. So he arrested me, brought me down to the police station, and basically said, okay, you, this is like your third or fourth time being arrested. He said, you, we're basically going to charge you as an adult. Now, as tough as I tried to be as a teenager, because as teenagers, that's the way you act. I tried to be tough. Like, I was so scared. And I had gotten to a place in my life, and I don't, some of you, you've gotten to this place in your life as well. I just gave up hope. I didn't think there was anything out there for me. I thought the whole mission of my life was survive, to get through, 
be old enough to move out of my home. That was my mission. And I remember I was sitting in this police station, and I, I looked through the window, and my mom walked in the police station, and I see her almost pleading with these police officers, and I'm thinking, oh no, she's going to get me in more trouble. Like, I couldn't figure out what she was doing. And the policeman, the, the police officer walked in, and he said, okay, I talked to your mom. We have, a, we have basically two options for you. Either we're going to charge you as an adult for these three things, or these things you're, you're dealing with, or you can get on a plane tomorrow to Indiana to go live with your dad. And I'm like, well, that's going to be something I need to pray about. Indiana. <laughs> like, it was very much, you know, I don't want to go to jail. Like, I'll go to Indiana. And so I got off the plane, never going to church, never being around church at all. And my dad, as soon as I walked off the plane, he's about 100 pounds heavier than I am. He looked at me and said, I ain't asking. You're going to church. And he's a big dude. So I'm like, yes, sir. I'm going wherever you say I'm going to go. Like, that's where I'm going to go. But I remember walking into church. And I was just hopeless. And I was hurting. And I was just broken. I remember I walked into this church feeling like, I don't even know why I'm here. And I started hearing a message of hope. And I started having people look me in the eye and say, your past does not define you. Your, your past does not have to be a limiter for your future. In fact, a lot of times, your past is going to be what God uses in your future. And for me, hope started to return. Hope simply says that there is more in front of you than behind you. Hope says there's more in front of you than behind you. And I think for some of us today, we walked in and we think what's behind us will always hold us back from what's in front of us. And let me just say this. We serve a God who says your past does not necessarily limit you from your future. In fact, God will use our past as something to propel us to move us forward. That he will oftentimes use what was behind to propel us into what was forward, not to prevent us from what's forward. And I believe as Christians, I just believe this, in every interaction we're in, with every person we're in, we need to bring that message of hope. We need to be people who speak a message of hope. We need to be the type of people that in every interaction we're in, every situation we're in, every people we're around, we need to bring a message of hope. And here's what I think. I think as Christians, what we need to do is we don't need to look at where they are. We need to look at where they could be. I think so many times we look at where they are and we judge where they are and go, I can't believe they, and oh, how did they do that? And we judge where they are instead of looking at where God might want them to be. And I believe we have the ability because we have a hope in our heavenly Father. We have a hope, and it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that he wants to give us a hope and a future. And the people in our world, he wants to give a hope. And we have the ability to look at where someone is and not judge them for where they are, but go, hey, God has more for you. God has more for you. God has a future for you. God has a hope for you. There is more in the future for you. And we have the ability, to, unlike most other people, to speak a message of hope. And we can say, God is not giving up on you. God has a plan for you. God wants more for you. Come on. I think as Christians, we can speak this message and tell people that God is not given up. We need to bring hope into every situation that we're in. We need to speak a message of hope to our kids. And let me just encourage you, if you're a father, your words will shape the identity of your children. We need to be speaking to who they could be, not who they are. And we need to be telling our kids who they could be and not who they are. Come on. I believe that we need to be speaking of, to people's future, not to their present. We need to be speaking to what could be, not what is. And we need to be speaking a message of hope. And let me just encourage you, and let me just say, say this area is so huge. This is especially true on social media. I mean, come on, if we were to read our Facebook posts and our Instagram posts and our Twitter posts, I mean, would we read through our posts on social media and go, wow, they are so full of hope. <laughs> They're so full of hope about this election. They're so full of hope about the future of America. I and mean, would they read that about us? Would people around us read that? What if we could be the group of people that would actually be hopeful in a time that seems hopeless? I mean, what would that speak to the world to say, you know what? I don't care what's going on out there because we trust in a God who's in control. Come on, we trust in a God who's in control. He's got us. He's handling it. He's with us. And our trust is not in man, it is in God. We need to reflect hope. So let me ask you this. Who in your world needs hope? Who in your world 
needs help. Who is in a hopeless situation who feels like they are stuck where they are? Who do we need to go through this week and speak to a message of hope? And he goes on. He says, he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. Bind up the broken hearted. The second thing that we need to bring into every situation is healing. Is healing. We need to bring healing into every, re- every interaction, every relationship in our lives. Now, when you say healing, as I was processing this and speaking about this, feeling like God is speaking to me, I'm like, God, what does this mean? I mean, what does this mean? Because it's not like every situation you just want to bring like healing, like healed. Like, you know, that that's, that's, seems a little weird. And, and here's, here's what I think this means. I think for us that when people are struggling in different situations, I believe God will use our presence to bring healing. I had a friend this week who actually got news, and it was very surprising news, that he got news that he was going to lose his job. And I called him, and I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? And he kind of told me how he was doing. And here's what I said to him, because for me, I don't always feel like I'm the best person to call when you're struggling with something. I just want you to know that if you call me and are struggling with something. Because for me, there are some pastors that you'll say, oh, I'm really struggling with this. And they'll say, it's okay. You're going to do great. God's got you. That's not who I am. When you tell me you're struggling with something, I'm like, oh, that stinks. Your life's over. Like, that's just the way I am. I'm just, I'm. Like, I don't have this, like, faith gift of, like, it's okay, God's in control. Like, for me, I'm like, I don't know why God abandoned you, but it seems like he has. Um, So, again, don't call me. If I come to the hospital, you're going to be more sad when I leave. It's the way it works. I'm not very good in those situations. I'm always a little like, oh, that is terrible. Man, whatever. I guess we can pray, but I don't know. I just... uh, um, that's why I don't go to the hospital very much. But that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's the struggle I think we have. And for me, I have that struggle too. And if you feel like when people ha- are going through a situation or struggling with something, if you're like, oh, I just don't know that I can offer anything. Let me, let me just say this. I think that God will use our presence in those circumstances more than we know. In fact, here's the phrase that I use anytime that people are going through a struggle, especially with those relationships in my life. The phrase is this, go to the mess. Go to the mess. That's it. But here's the reason why. Because for me, I know that when people are struggling, if I can just go to the mess, God will use me in the mess. And so for me, I called up the guy and I told him. I said, oh, man, I'm so sorry you lost your job. I don't really have a word of encouragement for you, but you can talk and I'll just listen. And he talked and he cried and he struggled. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of of Christ. When we just simply bear each other's burdens, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. And that's what we need to do. We need to say, you know what, I don't know how to get you through this, but I will be in this with you. And I don't know how to carry you, but I will walk with you. I don't know, I'll try to carry you, I'll try to help you through this, but I will bear your burden. I don't know how to make you happy, but I will be sad with you. I don't know how to make you strong, but I will be weak with you. I will walk through this with you. And when we decide to do that, we will bring healing and God will bring healing in the mess. So let me ask us this. Who in your world is going through a mess? Who in your situation is struggling with a mess right now that we look on and we go, oh, I don't know. And we've kind of stepped back away from the mess. Who is going through a mess right now in their situation and we need to step into the mess? Who is that person? What is that situation that we need to walk into this week. Maybe it's a text message, maybe it's a call, maybe we need to take them out to coffee and have a conversation with them. And then the verse goes on, it says, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the, fr- of the prison to those who are bound. The third thing that we need to bring into every circumstance, every situation, is freedom. It's freedom. Here's, here's the desire of our Heavenly Father. I'm just telling you, God is our Heavenly Father, and His desire is to set everyone free. Set us free from addiction, set us free from guilt, set us free from shame, set us free from you fill in the blank. God wants to set you free and God wants to set me free and God wants to set us free. And my question is, what does God need to set you free from? And here's the reason why. Because God will use whatever he sets us free from to help set free other people around us. And there are so many times, for me, when I was 14 years old, um, I started smoking cigarettes. Like, that was kind of my thing when I was 14 years old. Well, I smoked cigarettes until I was 23. So it was a long time, nine years. 
and God just, God just freed me from that. And he just allowed me to be free from that. Well, since then, you know, since then, God has used that story and that circumstance, and people will come up to me on a regular basis and go, man, I'm just struggling with quitting smoking. And I'm like, I quit smoking. Let me help you. And there are so many times when God will use our past struggles and our past things that we were felt captive in to help bring freedom to the people around us. What are the things that we need freedom from? Because God will use those things to help bring freedom and others. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free and God has set you free because he wants to use your freedom to help others get free as well. And here's the reason why, and here's kind of the phrase that I've kind of coined or, or used to help you remember this. It's that hope, healing, and freedom point people to the kingdom. Hope, healing, and freedom point people to the kingdom. It's kind of a little rhymey in there to help you memorize it. And here's what I think. I think that if we use these three things, hope, healing, and freedom, in every circumstance, in every situation, in every relationship we're in, if we can bring hope, healing, and freedom into every situation, I believe that God will use those three things to draw people to him. I believe that if we were to walk into every situation and to speak to everyone as if they are greater than they currently are, I believe if we were to walk into every situation and be present in the mess, I think if we were to walk into every situation and say, where are you struggling? Let me help you. I believe if we did those three things, I believe that people would be drawn to him and we would say, this is not me. It's not in my power. It's not in what I can do. It is in what God can do. And people would see him through us if we walked into every circumstance, in every situation, and brought hope, healing, and freedom. And if we do those three things, we will point people to our Heavenly Father, and we will point people to him, and people will experience the loving grace and mercy of God in our lives. And as we talk about this, you know, for a lot of people, as we talk about this and say, hey, so go to the mess. So go and help people get free. So, you know, so go and bring hope. I mean, a lot of times people will say, yeah, but, but Mike, <laughs> I can't do that. I mean, and honestly, I can go and bring hope and speak life and do some of those things. But let's be honest, there are people in our world that we, <laughs> we look on and go, they are way more messed up than I ever was. Like, they are way too messed up. Like, I can't help. Like, I, the, the mess is too complex. It's too messed up. And here's what I would encourage you. That we have to bring hope, healing, and freedom into every situation. But I would also say, we also need to invite people to come to a place where they can experience hope, healing, and freedom. And in your notes or on your seats, depending on where campus you're at, then I would say this. There are invite cards to your church, to your campus. And I would encourage you with this. <laughs> Go and take these invites and ask yourself the question, who needs to be at a place where they can experience hope, healing, and freedom? And then go invite them this week to Grace Family Church because when they walk in here, they're going to experience hope, they're going to experience healing, they're going to experience freedom. They're going to come into a place where they are going to feel like they just came home. So here's what I want us to do as we close out tonight. What I want us to do is I want to pray for you and I'm going to pray for two things. One, I'm going to pray for wisdom, that you would know who you need to bring hope, healing, and freedom to. And the second thing I would say is that I'm going to pray for courage, that we would have the courage to go to those people because there are people in our world right now, let's be honest, that, that they need hope. And they're hurting. They're hopeless. They don't feel like they have a purpose for their life, and we can bring those bringers of hope. There are people in our world right now that they need healing. They are brokenhearted. They are struggling. And we can be that. And there are people in our world who are struggling and they need freedom. They, they're, there's something that they are just hurting right now and they need freedom. And for us to, be, to bring those things into those circumstances, we need courage. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. All of, all of the campuses, close your eyes and bow your head. And if you need wisdom to know what person to bring hope, healing, and freedom to in your world, you've thought about it, you kind of racked your brain, but there's not a name that's on your heart right now. If you need wisdom right now, I'm just going to ask you with your eyes closed and everyone's eyes closed, just to raise your hand. Say, God, drop a name into my heart. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Once you put them up, you can put them down. Awesome. God, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom to know who we need to go to. Jesus, right now, I pray that you would drop names into the hearts of people to know who we need to go to this week, who we need to bring hope to, who we need to speak over, who, who we need to bring healing to and go towards the mess. 
God, I pray that you would give us a name, who to help with their freedom, with their struggle, with the situation that they're in. And with our eyes still closed and our heads still bowed, let me ask this question. Who in your, in your world do you know you need to go to? And you know the name, but honestly, you need courage. You need courage because it's hard to get out there and it's hard to do this. And you need God's supernatural courage as you walk out these doors and you go to bring hope, healing, and freedom into the world. If you need courage, come on right now at every campus, just lift up your hand and say, God, I need your courage. God, I need your courage to take this forward. I need your courage to go and do this. Come on, as soon as you raise your hand, you can, you can put them down. Jesus, right now, I pray over the people who've raised their hand. God, I pray for courage. That Jesus, we would have courage to walk into every situation, every circumstance, every relationship. And God, I pray that you would give us a supernatural courage that we would be able to walk boldly into some things that seem messy, some things that seem hard, some things that we're gonna struggle with. And God, we pray right now that you would give us the courage to do it. And with our eyes still closed and our heads still bowed, for some of us, we would say, we would say the thing we're struggling with is we, we need hope, healing, and freedom in our life. We have a mess right now. We're struggling right now. We have a situation and we just don't know what to do. But there is hope, healing, and freedom with a relationship with Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants to bring into your life. And if you've not accepted him, if you've not gotten to a relationship with him, this is a free gift. And he says, come into a relationship with me, and he will bring us hope. He will bring us healing, and he will bring, us fe- bring freedom. So if that's you right now, on the count of three, I want you to lift up your hands. One, two, three. Awesome. Lift up your hands. Come on. And, and if that's you, will you just keep your hand up? Jesus, right now, we lift up our hands saying, we need you. We need hope. We need healing. We need freedom. God, our hand being raised, this might be we're just hopeless right now. Or we're in a mess right now. Or we feel caught in something and we need freedom for those. So God, right now, we just ask for your power and your strength. And God, we invite you into a relationship. And God, we pray that you would be with us and give us hope, healing, and freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.